get you on the air. Got no hey, I got the question. Oh, whoa. Hey, all right. Hello, uh, New Orleans, San Antonio, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Atlanta. And peace out to all those soldiers out there. Welcome to Yahweh's and Yeshua's Barbershop. Uh, today we have uh, some guests and a special guest. And uh, we're going to pan. We have in the white over here Mr. Joe. Say hello, Mr. Joe. Yeah, I am. Mr. Lee. Hello, how everyone's doing? Mr. I don't know if I should say your real name. A uh, black man soldier. Who's that, sir? And we have a real live, a real live barber in the house, Mr. Wade. Mr. Wade, say your name. Say the barber shop that you cut hair. At. Wade Crutchfield, Palms Barber Shop, 2111 Caden Street in Gentilly. All right, viewers. Uh, this show is patterned after barber shops in. Uh, I was talking to you know Mr. Lee a while back and uh, F.C. Smith, and we were talking about uh, eventually bringing on some real barbers. I mean, we just characters in a barber shop when we go to get our hair cut. But uh, Mr. Wade, in February, will uh, we will be filming a, a live barber shop scene? No holes barred the way they talk in barber shop. But Mr. Wade, only one thing uh, in the barber shop. They won't allow us to cuss, you know, because I know sometimes somebody might throw one. Uh, we, they just can't cuss, though, it, but they can do everything else. It won't be the same. It won't be the same? It won't be the same. Well, you can say, like, uh, <laughs> son of a biscuit eater, uh, mother Falstaff, something like that, you know? You know, keep it cool, because, you know, you can't cuss if they're kids and then come on, you know, barbershops are families establishing. But you know something, Mr. Wade? I've learned um, from barbershops. Um, my mentors were barbers, other than my close immediate family men, but my mentors were, were men of different lifestyles. And you know, I, I think a barber is like a, 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 well, I wouldn't say a preacher, but a preacher you listen and he's sensitive at times. They even say a bartender at times uh, may listen. And uh, I think a barber, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure you have a lot of wisdom that you can bring to this, this table. What would you say, Mr. Wade? Well, I, I think that is true, that um, that a barber is um, a mentor, a counselor, and um, all the other good things because, we, you know, we hear so many um, situations and, and, and problems that most clients have, and they, they feel comfortable with talking with the barber. So it's a good thing on one hand, and it's a bad thing on another hand because um, sometimes, you know, you as a barber, you might throw yourself in them different situations. and. Um, and it'd be kind of hard for the barber to come from out, you know, to going up and down on, on them different levels. And sometimes you might take some of them problems to the house, you know, that you hear from, from other people. So it's a good thing and it's a, and it's a bad thing on, on hand. But overall, I love, I love what I do. You love what you do, Mr. Wade? I Mr. love Wade, what I do. Mr. Wade, let me ask you, are you married? 11 years. 11 years? Wow. 11 okay, years. now, you brought it up. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you've seen this show because I remember one day I walked in your barber shop and you said, Apostle. <laughs> you said, man, your show is, is kicking. They said, you are you off the chain. You mm -hmm. and that, you talked about that fellow with the big stick, Mr. James, Brother James speaker, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know we don't usually hold back. Then you understand that, right? Yeah. You don't mind me asking you a question since you brought the subject Go up. Right here. You said, like, bringing issues to the to right. home. Right. Okay, and viewers, like, we want to get Mr. Wade out of the way because Mr. Wade has an appointment, so we need to get him out of the way, so I'm going to just hit him right quick. And uh, we'll see him in February, uh, ho hopefully in February or maybe before that. But, uh, Mr. Wade, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about, well, I know preachers have these problems a lot of times. Bartenders may have these problems. Bus drivers may have this problem. And I think barbers have this problem. Do a lot of women... Uh, hit on you guys because you uh, you uh, have that you carry that dollar bill. Well, I don't say it's because of um, what profession you're in. I mean, some professions it it, it do when you know um, athletes, um, actors. But it, as far as a barber, no, because um, it's the way you carry yourself. 
if you carry yourself openly like that, then you allow things to come at you. And um, th that's what I think. That's what I think it is. I mean, just like pastors. You know, I mean, if a pastor carries himself like that, then he, uh, he allow, you know, women to come at him. So I, I don't think that's for, you know, that, f that's, that fits the, the description. Uh, good answer, but you wasn't helping me, though. <laughs> can, I ask, can I ask Mr. Wade a question? You know, my daughter's in school right now in Houston in Paul Mitchell School mm -hmm. Haircutting. Do y'all do mostly hair cutting, or you do the coloring and stuff like that, or is it just the hair Well, we, cut? we do. We do it. Um, basically, haircuts. Mm -hmm. um, we do coloring, too, mm -hmm. you know, um, on men, not on women, though. So do you physically cut the hair yourself, too? Are you one of the yes. barbers? Yes, yeah. So are you, are you standing up, like, eight hours a day? Does that get to you, or what? Um, I was thinking about that with my daughter, man. It might be a field she's getting into that's going to be physically demanding on her later on in life if he's having to stand up all day long without moving around too much. Well, now they have they have um, shoes, um, proper um, footwear mm -hmm. that barbers and um, beauticians oh, yeah. wear now. Mm -hmm. That's that's easy on the knees. Is it good money? Is it a good you know? profession? I'm sure it would be, huh? A good profession? Well, I mean, I think selling toilet paper on the corner can be a good profession if you put, you know, mm -hmm. effort in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I know a lot of struggling barbers and beauticians. Oh, yeah? oh okay. Yes, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's all about, you know, mm -hmm. about your work ethics. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Wade, give your location of your barber shop. Take my number off right now, uh, peoples. Give the location of your barber shop and give a number to the viewers. Um, location of the barber shop is 2111 Caton, and the number two is 504-439-1645. One more time. 2111 Caton, 504-439-1645. All right, now before we go anywhere else, uh, fellas, I want to do a little personal interview with Mr. Key. Uh, maybe about, we just spent five minutes. We're going to try to do about maybe ten minutes. Then we're going to have to eventually break off, but y'all may want to ask him a question. And our main subject, uh, FC is going to be coming in, and he's going to be uh, finished hosting the show, and I'm going to just be a character witness, uh, as they say, usual suspect. But before we get to that, let me ask uh, Mr. Keith, they, uh, this is called Interview of a Soldier. Now, I don't know what kind of soldier he called himself, but I guess he's going to tell me. And uh, Mr. Keith. How you doing? Uh, you call yourself a soldier. Why do you call yourself a soldier? Because uh, ever since I've been conscious, I decided to make a change in my life. I decided not to do the negative thing that got me in prison the first time. And, and during that struggle, I found out that you come up against a lot of opposition, you know, mainly from your own people. So in that, in that sense, I call myself a soldier because I'm not going to compromise what I believe in. I believe in the Word, you know, and the Word was God, and I believe in all that. But at the same time, when I, the things that I read that I don't see in life, that makes me, you know, be a rebel, in other words. Because if I see something that's not scripturally written, then I'm a challenger. All right, Mr. Lee. You remember him yeah. from back in the days? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wasn't he a character? You know, yeah. talking as far as a villain. I mean, he, this man has changed now, but from what the reports I've heard, and he used to say it himself, he said he used to terrorize people. Well, you know him from that? Well, your yeah, environment has a lot to do um, uh, with us. And uh, I've been knowing Mr. Keat a long time, and we come up in, a, in an environment where... Uh, there wasn't a lot of teaching going on. And you had to get out there for yourself and uh, learn your environment. And in doing that, you had a tendency to have to uh, demand your respect. So, you know, with that said, uh, I knew him during that time uh, in that environment where you had to come up, you know, where we came up, and you really had to demand your respect. So uh, during that time, and with the knowledge that he had there, uh, during that time, he, uh, he used that, you know, to, uh, for us to keep himself. You know, and as time went on, I see that, you know, Mr. Keat has learned more. And that's the whole thing. It's all about education. All right. 
right. And I think that he have learned more, and with that knowledge, he has turned and used that knowledge in, in other directions. Okay, uh, so you saying you keep, but you came from the project then? That's correct. What project was it? It's the Melphamine Project. What about you, Mr. Keith? Melphamine Project. And what about the FC? You just well, FC it? come from the Desire Project. Uh, I, I know. All know, right, well, FC, uh, FC didn't. I don't think he'd been to prison, and it wasn't jacking people. Did you go to prison? Well, no, I, I didn't go to prison. All right then, but yet, Mr. Keith, mm. you went to prison. I see. I went to prison because basically. Well, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Just wait a minute, wait uh, a minute. Uh, Slow down. All right. You told me one day that across Earhart, any. No reflection on you, Joe, <laughs> but I got to say it. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep it like Joe Poole used to say, keep it real. Mm -hmm. He told me one day, any white person crossing Earhart. St. Charles. In St. Charles. Louisiana. Louisiana. You didn't tell me Louisiana. Broad, too? Yeah. You was com the whole minister society. Got to have them. Huh? Got to have them. You say you used to rob these people. Got to have them. There wasn't no... Well, no question. Once you crossing that territory there, it wasn't no question. Insurance man, bread man. Oh, no, not just insurance. Bread man, too? Uh, pizza man. Pizza, anything. You was a minister society, Keith. I was like. I don't deliver pizza in the project no more. Yeah, but see. Furniture but, man. Yeah, right, but everybody that goes and lives in the project one like that. But you know something? But uh, you, you say you've changed, but you went to, to prison. They finally caught you. They caught me in a situation where... Speak up. Don't, don't hold your head down. I'm saying they caught me in a situation where, in other words, the things you do, you, you get caught for just something you didn't do. Well, that's in the Bible, so, usually. <laughs> you mean, so, what goes around, come around. Yeah, what goes around, come around. At that time, they didn't catch me for what I did. They caught you for something else? They caught me for something, you know, somebody else did. Oh, okay, but guess what? And I couldn't, you know what I mean, I couldn't get up there and snitch, so I had to take my lick. Yeah, well, like I say, there's some people call it karma. You ever heard that before, Mr. Wade, karma? <laughs> yeah, we're good. Right. Come to them. Yeah, then other people just say, what you reap, you usually sow sometimes. Mm -hmm. Then innocent people, uh, bad things happen too because of Satan. So you was a soldier for Satan at one time. Let me ask no. so you went to jail. Mm -hmm. Someone told me that fella with the ball of the bullet, mm -hmm. The one sure. that be talking about Uhura, Uhura. My comrade, Amateur Clark. Amateur Clark, he be talking about Bill the Win. Mm -hmm. He used that slogan, Bill to Win, not the Win viewers that like blow in, but Bill to be a winner. Um, he said that there was some kind of landmark case that went to the Supreme Court and you was involved in it on the prison officials or whatever were murdering prisoners. In other words, convicts. Uh, is that what they called y'all, yeah, convicts? In 1983, I, I was beaten by a prison guard, and during that time, I realized that, you know, I'm getting tired of beating. Well, hold up, Mr. Key. You were tired of beating. I'm getting tired of getting beat. You don't think that when you were jacking them people that they were tired of being a victim of, uh, of you? No, I was tired of being poked. You tie so so you wind I up. Figure, you would I do figure, something wrong. Hold up, wait. I was going to attack the people. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, but no, what, 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 what the guy in prison figured, he would uh, 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 attack you because you was a prisoner. But two wrongs don't make it right. That's what I'm getting at. No. You understand? Know the, the people in jail evidently was wrong for beating you. Yeah. But as far as biblically, maybe that how they say a whooping that you got in jail was something that somebody should have gave you when you was a kid, so it just came and it gave it to you Probably then. Did. Probably did. Probably did. You, you uh, feel what I'm not being uh, hard on you. I'm just discipline. Yeah, you know, yeah, even no, though he was a man. Not in that situation, though. Yeah, but I'm just saying, evidently, that whooping, if you'd have got that whooping early, in other words, you it, probably wouldn't have been in jail. Day, if I would have met uh, W.C. Johnson, Albert Chewy Clark, Llewellyn Stone yet, yeah. before I went to prison, yeah. I would have never went to prison. Maybe, maybe. You, you was hard-headed. All right, but look, I let's needed, get back I to your prison. All right, you. W.C., the one, uh... W.C. Johnson. Right, that has Oster. the hangman noose, the Ku Klux Klan. Oster. Oster, yeah, yeah. He's black conscious and stuff. Yeah. All right, well, um, you, um, you went to prison, and they wind up... These, were they white, uh, Caucasians, and black officers, or black, just Caucasians? Black. It was blacks beating up in, on blacks? In, uh, in prison, uh, the most dangerous prison guard there is, is a black prison guard. Really? Because they're trying to impress the white guard, uh -huh. and they'll do basically anything yeah. to show that white man that, you know, 
I'm on your side. Ah, uh, I see. Can, can I say something? You know, one of the workers that works for me is a guy by the name of Anthony Black Guy. Well, he was what? He was telling me that the, that he'd rather be stopped by a white police officer than a black one because he told me that if he stopped with a white police officer, they'll just check and go along with the facts and say, okay, let me see this, let me see that. And the black guy is intimidating the black guy wait, the wait, whole wait. time. Anthony is a black guy that's yeah. So you say he told that, me that himself. And they say he'd rather be stopped by a white cop. Oh yeah, any day. Oh well, Keith, and and you probably know way y'all probably know in some of our neighborhoods, uh, we rather not get stopped by a white cop, huh? In my neighborhood. You don't want to get stopped by no cop. Oh, is that there bad? Especially at night. That bad? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> but look, let me get back to you, and then we got to hit Mr. Wade, uh, and then uh, Mr. Wade going to have to roll out. So, all right, you're in prison. They beating the hell out you. Mm -hmm. Well, that was good. They'll beat the hell out you mm -hmm. because you seem like a good man now. Mm -hmm. All right? So how did you get, did you do your time and you got out of prison, or, or something happened for you to get out of prison? Uh, basically, after the beating, uh, it was like, you know, in other words, I feel like if I can't touch you, you shouldn't touch me. Because if you touch a prison guard, you going to jail, you going to get time added on to yourself. So I say, well, let me even the school. Guy gave me a book that called prison, Self-Help Prison Litigation Reform. In other words, that gives you a step-by-step -step, uh, manual on how to file a suit. So when, I, when he gave me that book, I read it from cover to cover. I'm talking about small letters, uh, you know, index everything. So when he, I got you reading that book, and he also gave me a, a, a criminal code of procedure and a civil code of procedure. Right. I read both of those books cover to cover. So I armed myself with the knowledge to how to fight back, to fight the system back. And once I filed a suit, my first suit I ever filed in my life, I went to the U.S. U.S. District Court in Baton Rouge, won that. Uh, the state appealed it. And you said they were killing people too when they were beating them? In Angola, I mean. That's what you were at Angola? Yeah, huh? in Angola, it was like open season. Uh, all right, so so you won the first case, second case, now what happened next? They appealed to the Fifth Circuit. Okay. Now, they, when they appealed to the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit reversed the lower court decision and threw my case out. And you was a, you was your case was you was appealing to where they would change the law to where these prison guards just couldn't just beat the hell out of you. In other words, before my suit, prison guards can beat you, and they had a four-step criteria in order for you to win your case. All right, well, let's get back to now where you almost win. You, you on your last trip I mean, after they threw it out. After they threw it out, Fifth Circuit threw it out. I appealed the Fifth Circuit ruling. Right. And it went to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. And during that time, you know, dude would tell him, you ain't, gonna, you, you ain't got a shot, you ain't got a chance because you don't have a law. You, you're not right. going to win. You can't okay. beat the system. But just so have they, they granted my search away. In other words, they wanted to have a hearing on my right. case. I think that's your camera. They looked that way. And yeah, after, that, that, after that, you know, it was, I made history because I became the first person in the United States to win a U.S. Supreme Court decision, 7-2. So now... The way and they changed the law that now you have a prison guard just can't beat you now. All right. And that was in 1992. All right. Now viewers, you see that? First of all, just for the record, we don't need no disclaimer, but the apostle must say this: there are good police's out there, conscious police officers, whether they call themselves uh, Caucasian or or, or or black or whatever. They are good police officers, but they are also some rotten. Lowdown police is out there too. But what I've learned, for those police that are doing the job, regardless of whether you're riding or good, the issue is that might be the best thing if you catch a person doing crime and giving them time. Because prison changed this guy. I found out he's always at a lot of city council meetings or, or different meetings around the city. I hear that you talk to kids and then you meant the kids. Oh, all the time. Uh, in this school that uh, opened their door to me, I don't want the straight A student, I want the at risk student. All right, get a tight end shot of that and I want you to look at that camera and, and, and tell the people uh tell them tell them people that there? In a school that would open their door to me, no charge. I don't I don't charge nothing. All I ask for you to open your door and I'll come speak to not the not the good student. I want to speak to the student that's at risk. Bottom line.
All right, uh, Mr. Keith, could you give your name and your phone number to contact? Uh, every call, 817-584-1584, any time, any day. One more time, your number, slow. Every call, 817-584-1584. Tell him your name. Keith Hudson. All right, uh, Mr. Keith, so you made history, and you're in the history books. Many people live in life, and they just die. Many live in history. Some people make history, some people shape history, some people change history. And then there are those that you wish they wouldn't have been born because the things they've did in history are great crimes like Blanco uh, denying uh, help and many of our people uh, died so we would consider that wrongful death and murder. So Blanco is also in history for being a, the first governor. Just, in Louisiana to deny aid of helping their people. So many people died in. It's also a historical fact that Louisiana is known for corruption, and that governor is not in, I mean, she should do time and go to prison too. But that's another story. But the issue is first in history. So I'm proud of you as far as that, being the first person in history to do that to where now prisoners won't be beat. Mr. Wade, would you like to ask him any questions before you leave? Anybody else? Um, no, there's no questions asked. I just want to commend him on what he's doing. <clears throat> and, um, you know, there's a lot of um, kids out here that, that need that type of um, guidance, you know, from someone that been there and done that. They, they can take oh, yeah, word. Oh, big brother. He's, I'm proud of you. You know, they could take word from um, a whole lot better from someone that, that was there at that time that was doing what they was doing and changed their life from someone that, that never experienced that and trying to tell them a better life. So I just want to commend him on what he's doing. And, uh, man, keep up the good work because there's a lot, a lot of work out there for you. Push it up. How long did that whole process take you? Nine years. <laughs> Nine years. Nine years. And you were representing yourself again, huh? Representing myself. Uh -huh. They don't get you no lawyer. You don't get a law. You don't get a lawyer. No, no. Not in the state of Louisiana. Uh, Call it jailhouse lawyer. Right. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted uh, to tell Mr. Key to uh, stay encouraged, and uh, he have a lot of experience and knowledge, and, and it's a good. It's good, very good, to see that he's using that towards helping a lot of these kids that's lost, that a lot of people, you know, have just kicked to the curb. So I just want to encourage him to stay strong and stay focused and keep up the good work. All right, uh, Mr. Key. Mm -hmm. Joe, we even seen your show, and some of the other shows you have been on, uh, if not the barbershop, people take get the perception that you are actually a racist black man. Is that true? Basically, I just not. I just can't stand for foolishness because you know I'm not racist because my guardian angel is, is white. What do you mean by your guardian angel is white? Honorable Lindy Boggs, my guardian angel. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. Wait, wait, who? Lindy Boggs. Miss Lindy Boggs. She's my guardian angel. She's your guardian. She's a Caucasian, She's a elderly Caucasian. lady, right? Yeah. How is she your guardian angel? For uh, simple reason, once I got conscious in Angola, it was a threat on my life, and I knew that eventually I was gonna get be a victim of suicide. What you mean uh, a threat on your life? Who, who wanted words, to threaten you? Once you, you the case? once you once you make your once you make a conscious decision to do something in prison in Angola at that time, you was gonna eventually wind up hanging yourself. I thought, I mean, I've heard the stories where they say uh, prison may be so bad, or even some of these jails that people, uh, they say that people hung themselves, but people always thought that uh, somebody else hung them. So you're saying that they could beat the crap out you so bad or treat you so bad that the world don't know that you voluntarily hang yourself? That they'll hang you and say you hung yourself. Oh, okay, all right. And so, the because... The thing was, I'm not going to be a victim. So I got my mom to say, look, Get in contact with this Congressman Lyndon Boggs that says she do something for people and let them know that I need to know if my life is going to be secure in this prison. And your mama got in touch with her? She got in contact with her. He, she got in touch with Archbishop Hanna. The Catholic priest guy? Archbishop Hanna, along with Lyndon Boggs, called up that angle and made a, a firm commitment. If anything happened to this kid, under y'all care. Well, she had to put them down. All right, there you have it, viewers. Hats off to Miss Lindy Boggs. Miss Lindy Boggs. Much uh, love. Mr. Keith say his guardian angel. And uh, uh, 
Philip Hannon. Philip Hannon. Catholic uh, the Bishop Catholic uh, Hannon. minister, which you guys know I don't take too much to Catholicism <laughs> at all. But this one time, uh, Mr. Hannon, hats off to you, you did a good thing. And I'm pretty sure in heaven that will be recorded. Mm. Now, if you would uh, stop bowing down to them statues and, and speak against the Catholic <laughs> Church, you'd be all right. All right, uh, Mr. Key. Uh, that was great. We're gonna um, we're gonna stop right here. Controller, stop it. All right, I'll key everybody in. All right, welcome back to Yahweh's and Yahshua's barbershop. Um, <laughs> No, I, no, I was just thinking. Uh, I was just thinking about uh, how you used to terrorize all them people. Uh, confession of a soldier. Uh, I mean, so you used to interview with a soldier, but it was confession of a soldier. <laughs> and they, like you say, they got to take take widescreen. They uh they didn't get you for the crime you did. They got you for something else. But uh, that was the best thing that ever could have happened to you, Mr. Key. Most definitely. Yeah, speak up. Save my life. Yeah, most definitely, huh? Yeah. All right, and all you viewers, uh, I'm pretty sure if Keith hadn't did it, he'd already prayed and, and asked for forgiveness for all you people that he didn't wrong from the uh, milkman, the bread man, the, who else you say, insurance man? Man, insurance man. Uh, all right, man. don't get into it. I was just saying. Yeah. All right, viewers, we got <laughs> FC here. FC is in the house. Hello, FC. We know the possum. Good to be here, sir. Yeah, we gonna let FC uh, be the monitor or whatever on this next half. Uh, but before we do that, there, I wanna let viewers let you know. You know, FC sang praying time on the on the show. He's also sung a change gonna come on the show. Would you believe, Joe? This rascal <laughs> then went from gospel. <laughs> The country western, country and western, and blues. Man. Yeah, <laughs> can you believe that? There's a, hey, when's the pot, rock going to kick in? Oh no, that's not. On that other barbershop you was on, you you threw in a few curse words about at least between you and Mr. Keller about six of them and three three of them got through. He go to singing rock, I might holler something. With a brother, his brother reminded me of of, uh, of the blacks I used to deal with over at Four Chat. Yeah? Oh, uh, yeah, we were fighting all the time. Oh, boy, you got a fighting spirit, don't you? <laughs> I, I never forget one time, man, I was walking outside. There were about 300 blacks on the front of Nashville and Ferret. And here, we, here, here, here comes me and about five of my friends out. And we saw that, oh. man, and, the, and the, all hell broke loose. He ain't lying, because that could be another show. You done messed up already. Good thing <laughs> Mr. McHale not on here. <laughs> Look here, uh, FC, you have... Uh